going to say um, during um, the my presentation, I will put you on mute, but as soon as we get to your part, I will unmute you. Great idea. Sounds good. Good morning, everybody. Um, we'll get started today. It looks like it's just 10 o'clock. Thank you all for joining. We're really happy to have you today on this month's webinar. Um, just so everybody knows, this call is being recorded. If you are experiencing any technical difficulty, please use the chat for assistance or the help options within Zoom. All lines have been muted today. And given the volume of virtual meetings and that our staff is working remotely in separate locations, we apologize in advance for any network connectivity issues and we'll do our best to solve problems as they occur. We appreciate your flexibility. My name is Alex Peters and I am an outreach specialist with the Wisconsin Cancer Collaborative. So we really, again, appreciate you all taking time out of your day to participate in this call. And we are delighted to have so many new people join us today along with our existing members. Before we get started today, given that the Wisconsin Cancer Collaborative is relatively new to some of you, I thought I'd spend one minute providing a brief overview of our work. We are the Wisconsin Cancer Collaborative, Wisconsin's statewide comprehensive cancer coalition comprised of 140 organizations working together to reduce the burden of cancer for everyone in Wisconsin. We connect our members with the tools, support, and knowledge they need to create healthier communities. Our work is guided by the Wisconsin Cancer Plan, which acts as a blueprint for action. The Wisconsin Cancer Plan combines best practices, reliable data, and concrete action steps for health system leaders, public health advocates, policymakers, researchers, and all other Wisconsinites engaged in cancer work. And I do wanna note that next month, we will be unveiling the new 2020-2030 Cancer Plan. So we hope to see you next month as well. And if you are not yet a member of the Wisconsin Cancer Collaborative, we would love to have you join. Membership is free and you can join at www.wicancer.org. Let's go over the agenda for today's call. Today's webinar will provide resources and information about COVID-19 and cancer risk reduction factors. You'll first hear from the Department of Health Services on the current state of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. Next, I will discuss cancer risk, risk factors and the implications COVID-19 may have on them. Next, I will speak in more detail about alcohol, the alcohol cancer connection and why it's important for cancer organizations to care. And finally, we will hear from Julia Sherman of the Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Project, who will speak about how alcohol use patterns in Wisconsin have changed since the pandemic and how Wisconsin's alcohol landscape has evolved in the wake of COVID-19. We have staff monitoring the chat and we will do our best to answer questions and address comments. But if we miss something, we will provide a recap and an email follow-up we intend to send out after today's call. There will be time at the end to ask questions. I would now like to introduce Dr. Mark Wagner. Dr. Wagner serves as the Chronic Disease Medical Advisor within the Wisconsin Division of Public Health at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. In addition to answering questions you may have about COVID-19, and chronic disease, including cancer, Dr. Wagner will provide us with a brief update on Wisconsin's COVID-19 numbers as of yesterday, July 8th. Mark? Thank you, Alex. Uh, yeah, the, the Department of Health Services continues to provide daily updates on the number of COVID-19 cases in the state, and all the numbers are always updated as of 2 p.m. every day. Um, the data you can take a look at, it's by following the link that's on the slide here, the dhs.wisconsin.gov slash COVID-19, um, or you can just go to dhs.wisconsin.gov and there will be a link up at the top for that. Um, and we're continuing to update the website with different things, different uh, ways to look at and analyze the data and people can download the data as well. Um, we've got uh, information on county and census tract data, so you can kind of track 
how what the situation is within your community. Um, and as you can see from the map, um, all 72 case counties have positive cases at this time, uh, which is uh, which was also the case last month when we talked. Um, overall, we have had over 600,000 negative test results, positive test results. Current case number is 33,154. Uh, we've had 3,683 hospitalizations and 807 deaths. Uh, we are looking into as well um, information on uh, comorbidities with individuals who had um, COVID disease, and hopefully um, we'll have something to share on that for the next few months. Uh, but we'll continue to look at that and try to find the best information we can. And I also encourage you to take a look at the website and see if you haven't looked recently to take a look at some of the new ways that you can, uh, uh, you can access the data and uh, look at information within your local jurisdiction. Go to the next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, and so again, we continue to see one of the ways that we do break down the data is by race and ethnic groups. Um, and you can see that we continue to see the disproportionate impacts um, COVID-19, uh, especially within the black community. Um, and uh, it's something we continue to look for ways to try to address as well. So that is the, so the update as of today, uh, and I will stay on the line if there are any questions um, after about uh, any of the numbers or uh, accessing the DHS data. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. It's been um, really great to have you on these calls and just see how um, things have changed month to month. Okay, switching gears now and getting into today's topic. We are now going to talk about cancer risk reduction behaviors and how we may see them impacted by COVID-19. Um, so just to get some um, groundwork and um, discuss some of these things that we focus on when we talk about reducing cancer risk, we know that uh, many cancer cases in Wisconsin can be prevented. While some risk factors such as age or genetic risk cannot be changed, other risk factors such as health behaviors can be modified to lower risk and prevent disease. The World Health Organization estimates that 30 to 50% of all cancer cases are preventable. In the United States, health behaviors such as smoking and excessive alcohol consumption contribute to 42% of all cancer cases and 45.1% of all cancer deaths. In Wisconsin, we know we can reduce cancer risk significantly by decreasing tobacco use and exposure, decreasing high risk alcohol consumption, increasing regular physical activity, increasing healthy diets, increasing protective behaviors from the sun and UV exposure, increasing HPV and hepatitis B vaccination, vaccine utilization, and also reducing exposure to radon. Um, we also just want to acknowledge that we know personal health behaviors are strongly influenced by the environments in which we live, work, learn, and play. Environments that support health are those that include strong clean air laws, limited alcohol outlet density, access to safe green space, access to healthy food that is affordable and culturally appropriate, access to affordable preventative health care services, radon testing in homes and schools, workplace safety protections, and many other structural factors that contribute to the personal health behaviors that affect cancer risk. Now, let's take a closer look at these behaviors um, and why they are important to keep in mind during the pandemic. And um, we know that many of the same factors that impact cancer risk also impact one's risk for severe illness from COVID-19. So starting with tobacco use, we know that tobacco use is a major risk factor for cancer, along with a number of other illnesses. In addition to being a major risk factor for cancer, research has shown that smoking cigarettes is associated with an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Now more than ever, it's a great time to encourage smoking cessation. Um, in Wisconsin, we are lucky to have a really great free resource, the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line, especially in this day and age when in-person appointments may be limited. Having a quit line um, for people to call in is a really great resource for people to get free cessation help. It's available 24-7 
and some people may even be eligible for free nicotine replacement therapy. You can reach the quit line by calling 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Another important um, factor to look at is physical activity and diet. So we also know that regular physical activity and having a healthy diet can reduce one's cancer risk. However, with many of us sheltering in place, many of us are staying home and sitting down more than we usually do. With many gyms and fitness classes still being closed, it can be challenging for many of us to get the sort of exercise we normally do. And it's even harder for people who don't usually do a lot of physical exercise. It's important to still encourage everyone to be active during the pandemic and to have a healthy diet since we know that obesity is associ associated with a greater risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Another important risk factor to also keep in mind is sun and UV exposure. With more people staying home and opting for outside exercise, it is important to remember to use sun protection like sunscreen. Um, there have been myths around that uh, sun and high exposure to sun and high temperatures can protect you against COVID-19. Um, however, that is not true. We actually know that sun and UV exposure can increase one's risk for skin cancer, which is why it's important to remember that sun protection. Also, um, with more people spending time at home and setting up home offices, something else to consider is radon exposure. We know radon exposure is the second leading cause of lung cancer, so getting homes tested for radon can help protect you. And then moving along finally to alcohol use, we know that increased stress, um, we know that the pandemic is causing a lot of increased stress for many people and increased stress can lead to increases in alcohol and substance use. What we do know is that alcohol, drinking alcohol does not protect you against COVID-19. In fact, we know that alcohol can weaken your immune system, making you more susceptible to illness. In addition to that, we also know that alcohol can increase your risk for at least seven different types of cancer. Um, and why is this important for cancer organizations to care? Um, with the pandemic, we are beginning to see some changes in drinking patterns. And like I said, we know that alcohol can cause seven different or increase your risk for seven different types of cancer. And with increased drinking, it may lead to a spike of alcohol-related cancers down the road. So getting more into why it's important for us to discuss alcohol and cancer, we know that awareness of this connection is generally low. In a survey done by the American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2017, only about 30% of adults were aware of alcohol as a cancer risk factor when you compare that to 78% for tobacco use and 66% for sun exposure. Also, until recently, many U.S. cancer organizations were not discussing alcohol as a cancer risk factor. Studies have also shown that increased awareness of the connection between alcohol and cancer is associated with both individual behavior change and increased support for public policies that prevent and reduce excessive drinking. Alcohol use increases the risk of at least seven different types of cancers, as I mentioned before. We know that it can increase your risk for mouth and throat, larynx, esophagus, breast, liver, and colorectal cancer. The evidence for this connection is very well established, meaning that the research evidence for this connection has been clear for quite some time. So how does alcohol increase cancer risk? Alcohol itself has been classified as a known human carcinogen, group one, by the International Agency on Research on Cancer since the late, the late 1980s. We do know that there are many possible ways that alcohol does can't cause cancer in the body. This includes when the body breaks down ethanol, the ethanol in alcoholic drinks, acetaldehyde is formed, which is a carcinogen. Also, alcohol can block the body from absorbing certain nutrients like folate which are associated with a lower risk of cancer. Cancer, For example, a diet in high folate can reduce cancer risk, so if the body cannot absorb folate, that could increase the risk of certain cancers. We also know that alcohol increases the levels of estrogen in the body in females, which is why it, we know it is associated with breast cancer risk. Also, heavy alcohol use is associated with liver cirrhosis, 
which can then lead to liver cancer. And finally, we do know that alcohol is um, very high in calories, which can cause or lead to weight gain, which we also know is a risk factor for cancer. So how exactly um, is too much? We know that even light or moderate drinking can increase the risk of some cancers, including breast. But drinking heavily, especially over a longer period of time, has the greatest impact on risk. This is especially true for head and neck cancers. So what exactly is high risk? Studies define levels of drinking in a number of different ways. So let's break it down. High risk drinking includes binge drinking, heavy drinking, and underage drinking. Heavy drinking um, well, when we talk about alcohol use and cancer risk, what we're talking about is typically heavy drinking and binge drinking. And that is because we know that the more alcohol consumed over a longer period of time, the larger the impact on cancer risk. So when we talk about these two things, heavy drinking and binge drinking, we refer to that as excessive drinking. Breaking it down even further now, um, heavy drinking is considered eight or more drinks per week for women or 15 or more drinks per week for men. Binge drinking is defined as four or more drinks for women and five or more drinks for men on a single occasion. And a single occasion that typically um, the CDC defines that as two to three hours. Another thing to keep in mind too is what exactly is a standard drink? This is something that not the average person may always know. And so it is defined as either 12 ounces of beer at 5% alcohol, eight ounces of malt liquor at 7% alcohol, five ounces of wine at 12% alcohol, or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor at 40% alcohol. So now I'm going to switch gears and hand it over to Julia Sherman, who is the project coordinator for the, alcohol pol the Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Project. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Julia, and let you take it away. Thank you very much. Could we get the first slide, please? Oh, yes. Thank you. There has been a lot of discussion about how alcohol has changed, um, our consumption of alcohol has changed as a result of uh, the pandemic and the limitations and changes that have been forced on our society re as a result of it. It isn't just Wisconsin. Look at the quote in the bottom of the screen here, came from the Washington Post. Restaurants and bars are just waking up, but our livers have been working overtime. People have been drinking more and it's concerning that it is a pattern. Next slide, please. We already had alcohol-related uh, consumption and the harms that come from it increasing. Between 2000 and 2016, the death rates for alcohol more than doubled. Emergency department visits have increased by 61%. Um, Age-adjusted death rates from alcohol-related liver disease were up by 40%. These are national statistics within Wisconsin. We have seen that although underage drinking has stopped, um, binge drinking in Wisconsin has been flat for about the past 10 years. Next slide, please. When we look at underage drinking in Wisconsin, we see that every grade, uh, more Wisconsin high school students are drinking than the average na nationally. While the US and Wisconsin averages both dropped, and we were very proud of that, we worked hard to get there, the gap between the US average and the Wisconsin average rate of underage drinking, that gap increased. So we're not keeping pace with the national decreases in underage drinking. And now by their senior year in high school, we have more girls drinking than boys. It's 2% more, 74% uh, of the girls, 72% of the boys, but this is a very troubling trend. 
when we look at adult binge drinking um, that was explained a moment ago, you'll see that in Wisconsin, every age group in the state engages in more binge drinking than their uh, related group in throughout the United States. All races and ethnicities of Wisconsin residents engage at binge drinking in a higher rate than the U.S. median average for that group. So in other words, African Americans may drink less than uh, white, white Wisconsin residents. They still drink more than the average African American when compared to the national group. So what it makes clear is what we all suspected for some time, that our built environment in Wisconsin is affecting us all, regardless of our race, regardless of our ethnicity. Most troubling, 24% of Wisconsin adults self-report binge drinking in the past month. On a national level, it's 17% if I round up, 16.6%. Think of it, one quarter of everybody over 18, and that includes a lot of people that are not legal drinking age, are binge drinking about once a month. So we already have a troubling rate of alcohol use, and it will show up in our ca cancer statistics over time. Our concern now is holding the line and preparing to help it decrease in the future. Next slide, please. You've just said what binge drinking was, but let me tell you, there's a cost to it. In Wisconsin, binge drinking costs everyone in the state about three point, uh, it costs about $700 per person, $3.8 billion annually, all right? When we look at excessive drinking as defined, that's $6.8 billion annually. And that's based on 2013 figures. So that number might have gone up. If you're interested in seeing um, how that affects your individual counties, you can go to the Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Project. Both those reports are available there. And the binge drinking report is also available on the website of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. A lot of it shows up in local expenses, which is a nice way of saying the property tax. And a lot of it is also in lost productivity. We all pay a heavy price for Wisconsin's drinking rate, even if we never touch a drop of alcohol in our lives. Next slide, please. What did we find out during this pandemic? Let me break it down into the two things we all understand, what's legal and what's illegal. Starting with what's legal, we had a change in 2019 that was unrelated to the pandemic, but it's important to know. It used to be that if you were licensed as a class B on premises, a bar or a restaurant that sold alcohol to be consumed there, you could sell one of your customers about four liters of alcohol. In other words, if the local hangout had a type of scotch or a very unusual you know, type of spirits, you could buy four liters from him directly. However, with the supermarkets of alcohol, places like Total Wine and Spirits, some of you may have visited those, those locations are often licensed as a class B because they have so many tasting classes and so many sampling stations, they didn't fall under the traditional off-premises definition. So, in 2019, they went to the state legislature and asked for that to be repealed, making basically every place that is a Class B licensee able to operate like a liquor store as well. Step one. The second thing that happened was related to the pandemic. The Department of Revenue has made it clear they consider growlers original sealed containers for the purposes of off-premises purchases at Class B locations. Now, you may be familiar with growlers. That's a, uh, a container you own and that you would take it in, usually to a brew pub, and they would fill it with a local, bever local beer that they made right there. What this redefinition did is it expanded it to everywhere. As you may recall, that uh, the uh, 
stay-at-home order, the emergency rule, came through on St. Patrick's Day, which is a huge day for on-premises licensees, and they were about to be stuck with a lot of green beer and a lot of Guinness. So this allows them to sell, sell that in reusable containers for off-premises consumption. However, this reinterpretation does not have a uh, date on it, an expiration date on it. So it appears that right now that may become a permanent feature of Wisconsin um, Class B sales. Fortunately, there's still a lot that's illegal. Mixed drinks to go. A number of states allowed mixed drinks to go. Some had time specific purposes. On those that did, some have expired, some are ongoing. There is a nationwide effort to make mixed drinks to go a feature of bars everywhere in the future. A bill was introduced and an effort floated by the Wisconsin Tavern League and its supporters in April. And I'm proud to say it fell like a thud. But just because it wasn't included in the emergency order doesn't mean they're giving up. Um, the hospitality industry has made it very clear they would like to go back to this in the future. The second thing that continues to be illegal is alcohol delivered without an on-site face-to-face purchase. In Wisconsin, if you want to sell someone alcohol, they have to come into your store, present their ID. You have to look that clerk in the face, have a payment. Now, you can have them deliver it to your home later, but you cannot order it online and you cannot call it in and then have it brought to your home. That is legal in some states, and many states made it legal as a result of the pandemic, but Wisconsin did not. Serving alcohol outside the licensed premises, the area that's defined on the alcohol license itself, is illegal. So many licensees have asked to have that licensed premises redefined. We already saw that begin to happen with click and collect in Wisconsin. This pandemic may um, encourage people to take it even further. Next slide, please. The one thing about public health stat data is that you know what's happening, but sometimes you don't know what it means. We saw alcohol sales skyrocket before the quarantine. And a lot of us hoped that people were just docking up for the next two, three, or four months. They weren't. Uh, but the, the statistics here give you an idea. Alcohol sales spiked in uh, the week of March 21st. Ready to drink cocktails, that rose by 106%. Consumers purchased more and more, 90% more of, of 24 and 30 packs. Last week, um, Andrew McGuire of Miller Coors says that they have actually stopped producing some kegs for on-premises locations because they can't keep up with the demand for the 24 and 30 packs. Uh, leader, the leaders of uh, the box wine, um, the larger containers of wine, those sales also skyrocketed. Instacart, which in general is still not used in Wisconsin, um, they measured a 72% nationally. A lot of what we know about alcohol sales, we know because of national statistics, Wisconsin specific statistics on sales are not really available. But we know just from talking to folks that more people are buying alcohol and the higher level of sales continued most recently right up through the 4th of July based on retailer interviews and news reports. Next slide, please. There is an entity called Backtrack that it's a commercial firm. It's based in California and they allow real time testing of blood alcohol with a device that attaches to a cell phone and also simultaneously takes a photograph of the person that's breathing into this device. It's used by a number of commercial clients, people that um, uh, businesses that need to confirm that their employees are sober they're driving, they're handling um, heavy equipment, individuals that uh, they need to check on their sobriety for legal or recovery purposes, and even in some cases of domestic um, family law litigation, they need to confirm the uh, sobriety 
of certain individuals. They have customers all over the nation. And with the pandemic, they began releasing some of the anonymized data. Obviously, this is not a scientific sample. It is not reflective of the population as a whole, but it is very interesting to look at. The largest increase in BAC in Wisconsin was Friday, March 27th, where it increased 320% over the average BAC. Now, here's the interesting thing. The following Tuesday was the largest decrease in the average BAC. But overall, the BAC in Wisconsin increased by about 13%. It decreased on the weekdays, and it, in, it um, increased by 114% on the weekend. Next slide, please. Here's the detail of that first Friday. It shows you what it was. The before the quarantine is in gray, and then after the quarantine. Now, it's important to note that how they define the quarantine is not consistent with the emergency stay-at-home order in Wisconsin. This is data, as I said, it is not a scientific sample. This is simply here to give you an indication, but the simple truth is no one could look at these numbers and say, there are people in Wisconsin that are drinking heavily during the quarantine period. Next slide, please. Here is something that I found just really fascinating. Weekday drinking in Wisconsin dropped, but while it increased elsewhere, the hypothesis being that people were home and they didn't have to commute to work, and so they would be more comfortable drinking after work. You know, the end of the work day just means walking out of your den or extra bedroom or leaving the kitchen table. So other states saw an increase. In Wisconsin, we saw a 42% decrease in weekday drinking. You have to ask ourselves, are we doing a lot of our week day drinking in bars? And did the closure of the bars have this impact? On the other hand, look at that weekend drinking. Other places, weekend drinking went down. Hi, the hypothesis being that it's because the bars are closed. But in Wisconsin, weekend drinking increased by 114%. So people were really drinking very heavily on the weekend. I think us in Ohio, we're both Midwestern states. I just picked it. But I think it's an interesting comparison. Like a lot of these data, we know what it shows. We don't know exactly why. Now, go ahead. You're right on target, Alex. Thank you. So what concerns me and a lot of public health uh, specialists in alcohol is that we know that increases in alcohol consumption appear to remain baked in. They continue after a traumatic event. There was research done after hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and after the SARS epidemic. And what they found is that the financial difficulties, the isolation, uncertainty about the future, it all led to worsening patterns of alcohol use, simply put, increases in alcohol use. But the other point that was very interesting is that the affordability of alcohol and the availability of alcohol also had a strong impact on those outcomes. In other words, the price of alcohol and how easy it is to get a hold of continues to be a significant factor in alcohol consumption. Next slide, please. One of the things we are not going to see in the public health stats for years to come, but we need to think about our children. The situation for children has changed dramatically, and here's why. Their summer uh, organization, their, their summer programs, and their sports, they've been canceled. They've been out of school since March. They're with their parents at home who are often working at home and may not be able to closely monitor teens and tweens. We know from asking kids that their first experience of alcohol is most likely to include alcohol that is borrowed pilfered, I hate to say stolen, but we all know what I'm talking about, from their family home or a friend's family home. Now, if people are keeping higher numbers, more alcohol at home, people are keeping a couple of cases of beer, for whatever reason, in an ugly harvest gold refrigerator, 
it's going to be more likely the kids are going to secure it. Nobody's going to miss one or two or three or four beers anymore. So what we can do is, go ahead, please. We need to secure it because the most basic form of prevention is not letting kids get a hold of it. It's basically the tween and teen version of putting it out of the reach of the children. Kids can't drink what they can't access. So people have to think very carefully about locking up their alcohol. Local community anti-drug coalitions and in some places community groups can help pay for and distribute refrigerator locks. These are two pictures I pulled off the net. We need to include empty nesters and even people with very small children that may not normally think about this because we know that tweens will go from house to house, unlock garage to unlock garage, and there are a lot of unlock garages in Wisconsin, and just take two or three beers. It doesn't take a lot to discourage a middle school kid. They see the lock and they're going to move on. So it's very important if there are unsecured stocks of alcohol in your community. It's actually good prevention for a lot of reasons. We know that children that begin drinking at age 14 or earlier increase their lifetime chance of alcohol abuse and dependence from 10% that we're all born with to about 41%. That's a dramatic increase. And a 14-year-old is not making a decision. They're taking an opportunity. So it's our job to make it less easy to do it. In addition, especially when you're dealing with cancer risk, we want to limit that exposure to this carcinogen. The other thing that communities can do is of course encourage people to participate in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey if your school district does not. It helps us monitor youth alcohol consumption. Go ahead, please. But there are things that are very important that are long-term that we need to start thinking about now. It is likely a significant number of licensees in Wisconsin will close and will not reopen. Many municipalities have ordinances that either require or allow those licenses to be recaptured by the municipality that issued it if, a, if, a, if an area, a, a licensee is closed for 60 to 90 days. The next person that opens that location is a new applicant. And a new application may be denied for any reason unless that reason is arbitrary or discriminatory. In other words, if a place is closed for several months, the community may say, you're out of business. Give me back your license. You need to look and see if your municipality has such an ordinance or if they'd be willing to adopt it. And then the community is under no obligation to grant a license to that next person that applies for that license or wants to buy that business. This is an opportunity to reduce the number of places that sell and serve alcohol in Wisconsin. Perhaps a once in a generation opportunity. Next slide, please. Let me explain why this is. According to Pete Madeline, who is the director of the Tavern League, those local bar and grills in our area, 70, 80% of their profit came from the alcohol. It's not worth their while to stay open to try to act like a liquor store, even though they have the right to do so under the law. Restaurants and supper clubs, they might be able to keep the cash flow going by doing takeout or their specialty dishes for takeout. But bars and grills, the places that have you know, a couple of taps, um, microwave food, maybe pizza oven, they were probably had no cash flow or very little cash flow for three months and maybe longer. So it's likely that a significant number of those locations will simply not be able to come back. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. We're not wishing ill health or ill uh, bad circumstances on anyone, but like any natural disaster, there's also an opportunity here. Next slide, please. Alcohol policies in Wisconsin are going to change. The immediate things that we are happening, seeing now is that communities are expanding the licensed premises often into parking lots or they're closing streets and expanding it into the street to allow for restaurants to keep going with social 
distancing. Some communities like Oshkosh have adopted a detailed ordinance with very importantly, a time limit. This ends on October 31st. If you don't put a time limit on it, you've expanded your licensed area into the parking lot, basically in perpetuity until that licensee either sells or goes out of business or a new applicant comes along. Conceivably, you could put up a tent out there and keep serving until hunting season, or it's just too cold for people to come inside. So if in fact your community is expanding licensed premises to accommodate social distancing, you can do it with an ordinance. It will allow those restaurants to keep operating without permanently expanding the licensed area and potentially dramatically expanding alcohol availability in your community. The second thing that's gonna happen immediately, and this refers to the slide before, is you have to resist the effort to refill the vacant commercial properties that were bars that closed immediately or small stores that were off premises. Resist those efforts. We all want it to get back to normal. We all crave normal. But in fact, when a property is vacant, the next person that comes in is a new applicant and that license can be that license application can be denied. We know there are too many places in Wisconsin that, that um, sell and serve alcohol. We know that higher rates of outlet density will increase higher rates of alcohol-related crime and disorder, even if everyone obeys the law. We know that living in an area with a high number of alcohol outlets increases adverse childhood experiences, and we know that a high level of alcohol outlets, a high level of density will increase the amount that people drink, and that all relates back to increasing their cancer risk. So it's important to help your community resist that effort to refill vacant commercial properties that were bars. In the long term, we will see an effort in Wisconsin to legalize carry out mixed drinks. That just curdles my blood to think about, and I suspect it does yours as well. We will also see efforts to weaken or eliminate the three-tier system. Anyone that's interested in that, I'm happy to talk to them, but that bill will be out there. And we know that there will be an effort to legalize online or telephone sales of alcohol for phone delivery, where people will never have to walk into a store to present a credit card or uh, cash and have a face-to-face -face sale. One bill was already introduced. It didn't get anywhere. This will dramatically increase uh, the availability of alcohol in Wisconsin. It is likely to have a dramatic impact on underage drinking. Think about all the 18, 19, and 20 year olds you know that have a credit card. That bill will be introduced in the next Wisconsin legislative session. And the Wisconsin Institute on Law and Liberty is already beginning to beat the drum on these last two items. We can eliminate the three-tier system and legalize online um, sales of alcohol. Next slide, please. But right now, as the Tavern League says, Main Street, Wisconsin is in jeopardy of changing. And I would add to that, for the better. Reducing the number of bars on your Main Street is likely to be beneficial to the community. Next slide, please. So I want you all to help me prepare to resist the pressure to refill those vacant bars quickly. There are several things that can be done now to prepare. One, map your existing outlets. A map would identify a cluster and as the Winnebago County Public Health Department just did, they just completed marvelous maps of those communities. And let me tell you, a picture really does tell a, have a thousand words. When you look at that map, you don't need someone to define a cluster. You can see a cluster. But we also have to document the problems they cause, such as things as how many of your EMS calls are alcohol related? When you consider alcohol related falls, it's likely to be a significant portion, but we don't normally collect that data in Wisconsin. 
How many of your police department calls for service are alcohol related? We don't officially collect that data in Wisconsin, but your chief of police can probably tell you. Call your domestic uh, violence shelters and services groups and see if they've had an increase in calls for service during this period. Uh, I know that in Dane County, there have been a significant increase in domestic disturbances. Your community might have experienced that as well, especially alcohol-related ones. And then alcohol-related emergency department visits and urgent care visits. How many more of, are they seeing? The simple truth is we know that in Wisconsin, alcohol-related falls kill almost twice as many people each year as alcohol-related vehicular injuries. So there are a lot of alcohol-related transports occurring out there. We just haven't documented them. Help us document that. Now, what's going to be different now, as opposed to many other occasions, is that you're likely to be have an effort to reduce the number of outlets on Main Street supported by remaining licensees. Why? They're hurting as well. They don't need additional competition in this environment. And we're not asking anyone to say never relicense. We're saying not now. The pause in relicensing, rebuilding a built environment that got us into so many alcohol related problems, a pause would allow us to evaluate whether or not we really need, whether we can really afford as a society additional alcohol outlets in those old locations. Next slide, please. So I got a to-do list for you. Map your local licensees, monitor your alcohol licensing process because that's the only way you're gonna be able to find out if somebody is planning on just closing their business and then handing it off to someone else. There is a lot of relicensing that occurs very quickly unless you're watching for it. You can inventory your municipal ordinances there's a tool on the Wisconsin Alcohol, Associate, uh, Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Project website to help you do that. Collect those local statistics I was just talking about, but also collect local stories about alcohol-related problems, harm to the community, expense to the community. That information, especially on the amenity problems, that's what they call things like littering, public urination that will occur around a cluster of bars, Documenting that and having local people say it's a problem, that really goes a long way to illustrating what you, the problems you've already documented with statistics. Next slide, please. I understand that no one could really get going from this brief overview, but here is my email and the website. And I would encourage anyone that wants to know more about any aspect of this to reach out to me directly. Alcohol outlet density will be an important topic at this year's Wisconsin Alcohol Policy Seminar. It is October 8th. It will be online this year, like life. And we will be, uh, our concluding speaker will be Michael Sparks. Many of you may be familiar with him already. That um, he is helped write the CADCA strategizer for density, and he and I are creating a Wisconsin-specific um, uh, presentation and exercise that we will help communities work through outlet density locally. But if you prefer not to wait, I'm happy to get started with anybody now. But I think many of you will find things that you find useful at the seminar. With that, Alex, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks so much, Julia. That was a really great presentation. We really appreciate you breaking all of that down. It was very helpful. You are more that, than I am. Go <laughs> I am going to now return to our presentation and open it up for any questions. I'm going to hand it over to our partnership manager, Beth, who is going to facilitate the Q&A session. Thanks, Beth. Great. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Julia. Great presentation and comments online, too. So thank you for that. Um, anybody that has any questions, please feel free to just enter them into the chat and we'll make sure we get them to Julia or any of our speakers today. 
Uh, we do have one question for Dr. Wagner that came in earlier, and it was regarding data on COVID-19, and is there any available for the Latinx population? Excellent question, and good to highlight that. Yes, that is another group that is disproportionately impacted, um, and you can find that information on our website right below the information on uh, uh, race. So if you just keep scrolling down towards the bottom, you'll see that. Uh, and you can see within that group, they represent 29% of cases and 12% of deaths, again, far above the representation um, within the um, population, the general population in Wisconsin. So another hard hit group and good for pointing that out. And we'll see if we can try to include more of that information on the slides uh, going forward in the coming months. Great, thank you. We can make sure to highlight that too when we send out information on the webinar. Um, and make sure that link is included. Were there any other questions for any of our speakers today or thoughts or comments? Okay. Well, there is the, I know Julia shared her contact information and would be welcome any questions or comments. Um, same with our team and Dr. Wagner. So Alex, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for closing. Sounds good, thank you, Beth. So just a few wrapping up reminders, like I mentioned at the beginning, next month's webinar is going to be introducing the Wisconsin Cancer Plan 2020-2030. Join us as we unveil the Wisconsin Cancer Plan 2020-2030, learn what's new in the latest plan out and how it can help you increase your impact. Fellow members will share how they use the Wisconsin Cancer Plan as a blueprint for action to guide their work. Registration for that is open, and you can find that at the link below. And lastly, we wanted to leave you with some resources on alcohol and cancer. We have three really great resources developed on our website. We have this infographic, we have an FAQ sheet, and we also have a slide bank available that you can download and customize as well. You can find those at the link below. And then finally, um, wanted to leave you with some resources that were referred to in the presentation around cancer risk factors and COVID-19 resources, and then also alcohol and cancer. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again all for joining and thank you to Mark and Julia for speaking today. I hope everybody has a great rest of their Thursday.